We are fortunate to have Dr. Silberstein here from Jefferson to speak to us about his remarkable and ongoing career in the field of headache. Welcome, Steve. Thank you. Uh, thanks for coming along and doing this interview for the American Headache Society. I grew up in Philadelphia, yeah, and I went to the University of Pennsylvania for all of my training. Yes, and I was able to uh, spend three years at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland, uh, between the time I finished my second year of residency in medicine and starting my neurology residency. It's obvious that you have enjoyed your career and have had remarkable contributions. Tell us about the, your trajectory in the headache field. It's a long story. I was at the National Institute of Health doing basic research. Mm -hmm. And our Sunday night dates, I used to go to the lab and kill rats. And yeah. I was looking at model, in vitro models of re -innervation. I worked in a great lab with Erwin Copen and Julie Axelrod, who won the Nobel Prize. But my wife made the observation, the only day of the week I came home happy is when I went to a free clinic and saw patients. So it's fairly obvious to me that oh, I love science, that I got greater pleasure out of taking care of patients. And then when I finished my residency, I went into general neurological practice. Mm -hmm. And while in general neurological practice, I found a need to take care of patients in the city from nobody else could take care of them. There was nobody else in the city I could refer a headache patient to. It was obvious to many that uh, you were in the forefront of uh, codifying these disorders chronic daily headache and chronic migraine. You also are a major contributor to guidelines, including AHS, AAN, and beyond. Can you discuss the importance of guideline de development for us so that the audience or future generations can maybe understand the concept behind it? Sure. I think one of the problems we have is there are a lot of different papers saying different things about different drugs. How is a physician one you're going to go to one source to tell you and give you evidence about how safe and effective they are. And what all a guideline does is look at the literature on a particular drug or treatment, looks at the quality of the evidence, analyzes it, and tabulates it for you. So you can tell instantly whether the drug you're using is used based on well-designed clinical trials mm -hmm. or anecdotally. And that's important because one, it'll get you better insurance coverage, but more important, you know it's safe and effective for your patients. But the old adage is the absence of evidence does not prove that yeah. it doesn't work, but at least if you look at drugs in a class, you can get an idea of what other drugs in the class might work for you. Any thoughts regarding teaching as it now appears that technology is taking the place of traditional diagnostic approaches, history, physical, and... You know, that's an interesting point. I remember when they, before the CAT scan, and we used to have to do pneumoencephalograms. Yes, I recall. And if you think about it, everybody saw the CAT scan would eliminate the teaching of neurology. Then came the MRIs and the imaging. The point is, you do a test for a purpose. Mm -hmm. And the purpose is defined by the history and the physical then you know what you're looking for. Too often people throw out a blanket of tests and then try to figure out what the results mean when the question is really, what do you think the patient has and what do you need to diagnose it? Any thoughts on the future trajectories of therapies in the field? I ask you this because you've been a leading investigator in numerous medication trials and now devices. I think you can look at this in several ways. What's the untrapped harvest of basic observations in the headache world. There's another neuropeptide called PACAP, which may be a target if the right antibody targeting it is developed. The other thing is cannabinoids. People have spent a lot of time looking at marijuana derivatives, but the body has its own cannabinoids. And if we can modify them and enhance the body's own endocannabinoids, it would enable us to do what the cannabinoids do without the side effects. They're anti-inflammatory, they're antinociceptive. So the question is going to be, can we target the enzymes that 
break down endogenous endocannabinoids. I want to thank you very much for coming along and sharing your views and opinions on this and congratulations on everything you've done here in Philadelphia because many years after we're gone, there'll be a lot of doctors walking around doing headache and they'll probably question why would anybody think otherwise. You're absolutely right. Take care. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for coming. My pleasure.